Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and open them to Daniel chapter 11? We're almost done with the book of Daniel. This is our 32nd Bible study. We have this, chap- this study and one more chapter to finish. And, and I am praying about what's next, looking forward to what God may have. But today we're in chapter 11, picking up where we left off last time in a Bible study that I've entitled, Trusting an Unknown Future to a Well-Known God. Because we're faced with quite a few questions. What am I supposed to do with my life? What does the future hold? Questions like, why am I here? And these are questions that believers and unbelievers have all the time. Who can I trust? Who can I go to? Where am I supposed to, where am I supposed to work? Where am I supposed to live? Who am I supposed to marry? How long am I to be single? And on and on the list goes. And these questions are valid and important, but sometimes they trouble us because we don't get the answer right away. It seems to be a familiar prayer and we don't get the answer right away, so they trouble us. And, and other times, they, they take us on a journey in our mind that if we're not careful, will not lead in deeper faith, but lead to deeper doubt. And I forget the person that I learned this from, but I didn't make it up myself. I did jot it down. He said, it's always good to trust an unknown future to a well-known God. And we have both of those in our lives. We have an unknown future in many ways. None of us know what tomorrow will bring. None of us know if even there will be a tomorrow. And yet at the same time, in our relationship with God, we are, he is well known by us. We're growing in our understanding of him, but we're, he's well known. He's shown himself faithful time and time again in our lives. And it's in the Bible that we learn of God. His love and his care and his concern for every man, woman, and child especially those that have repented and turned from their sins and asked him to forgive them. In Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, it's been a passage that's carried us through most of this crisis. It says, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster and to give you a future and a hope. But living in this world sends conflicting messages. Facing pain and difficulty, over and over again, there's this lingering question that comes. If God is a God of love, then why is there war and famine and crime and disease and wild viruses that shut the world down? Why is there death and destruction? And if God is who he says he is, then why does he allow these things? Well, we fall back on what God reveals of himself, and we know that God is a God of love. But this world has rejected God. Some of you have a testimony in your own life where you rejected God and you lived a life apart from God. You didn't look to him. You didn't surrender to him. You didn't ask him. You didn't follow him. You lived a life that you thought, well, maybe morally better than the next guy, but certainly not one surrendered to God. And as you lived your life, you lived it in rejection of God's love. And you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one master. And if you're not serving God as master, you're serving yourself. Little G, you've created, the Bible says in Romans, a God of your own making. You made yourself God. You made something else God. And you're really not even serving that God because behind that God, little G, is Satan himself. The cosmic battle. Jesus said it this way in John 3, 19. He said, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. I had a couple people come today praying, and a couple of texts come through on their prayer line, praying for a wayward kid, and praying for a prodigal. And a couple of them, uh, they had addiction issues. And I reminded them, God gave me a a word for them as I was praying for them. I was reminded of that time that Jesus taught us that... um, that whoever you present yourself to, you're a slave to them. And he used that example. Remember, he said, if you present yourself um, to, to sin, 
you, you kind of say, I'm going to follow sin, you become a slave to sin. And I'm paraphrasing here. You become a slave to sin. But if you present yourself as, uh, unto righteousness, you become a slave of righteousness. And the good news that God gave me in that verse, because it, it's pretty straightforward, but what good news that I gave, God gave me in that verse to share with this, these moms, there were two moms, was that you, the slavery is the same. So that when you're a slave to addiction, you think, oh, there's no way out. I'll never get out from under it. And I'm just stuck to it. And, and forever you present yourself to that sin, you're going to feel like a slave to that sin. However, when you present yourself unto God, unto righteousness and right living, and you turn away from your sin, you, you get the same effect. You're just like, man, I'm living for the Lord. I love the Lord and I, I can't get out from under it, but I don't even want to get out from under it. I want my life to change. I want my parenting to change. I want my mind to change. I want my attitude to change. Why? Because you become a slave to righteousness joyfully. You're no longer serving sin, but you're serving the Savior. And the Bible tells us that Satan, the devil, is the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world, the God of this age. And he's the one causing all hell and havoc to run loose. The stuff we read about in the news, the stuff we're experiencing personally. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So it's important as we are looking at an unknown future. It's important that we don't blame God for the difficulties in our lives. It's super important we have the right perspective. We're not to blame God for the way that things are working out right now and the way things are happening. The world has been under the authority of the enemy and is feeling the pains and effects not only of the devil's oversight but our own poor choices. I suspect there's someone listening to me right now that could say that they experienced the pain of their own poor choices just today. And you can't blame God for it. And really, we need to learn in a blame culture where we have a lack of people really wanting to take responsibility for their own lives, responsibility for their own choices, in a culture that's so comfortable in blaming everyone else, we need to step back and say, no, no, it's not, it's not someone else's fault. It's my fault. I take responsibility for my choices. And it's ready. You can jot it down in Ephesians chapter 6. It's time to be ready to put on that spiritual armor. And I think in a time like this, especially the helmet of salvation, just remembering our relationship with the Lord. Because if your, your view of the character and nature of God is skewed and you begin to believe a lie, we've already learned in the Garden of Eden, when you begin to believe a lie, you act on those lies and you find yourself farther and farther away from the Lord. With all that in mind, let's come back to Daniel chapter 10 and 11, because it was in chapter 10 that Daniel went to prayer. He was fasting and seeking the Lord with great spiritual intensity. It, it affected him personally, and he wanted to know what was going on. He understood, it says in in chapter 10, verse 1, he understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship. And as he's seeking the Lord, he receives the answer. The prayer was heard the first moment, you know, the instant, the day it was sent, but there was resistance on the answer coming, coming to him. And after this resistance, finally, there comes the answer. And what he saw in, and what we saw in chapter 10 is there really is a war in the spiritual realm. And we don't give so much, we live so much in the physical realm that it's easy to forget the spiritual realm. We're caught up in the physical. And especially in the last eight weeks or so, just everything about the physical, what we can do, what we can't do, go to work, can't go to work, you know, you know just all the challenges in the physical. But there's a spiritual reality and we learned that there was a spiritual war in chapter 10. That sometimes because of the spiritual war, answers can be delayed. Answers to prayer. But what we think is a delay is really the perfect timing of God. It arrives in the perfect timing of God. And even though it might be delayed and the devil thinks he's making progress, he's not. 
And I'm convinced as we look back in chapter 10 that if Daniel would have given up, he would have missed out on the blessings that God had for him right up ahead. He would have missed out. And and he would have missed out on the answer that God had for him. And you know, we we think of, well, wait a minute, why, why can't this whole delay, you come to this with a more logical perspective, and go, wait a minute, this is the God of all the universe. Why does he just wipe out the demonic realm right now? Why does he just take them out? Well, he could, and one day he will. But for now, he allows, he allows the opportunities for us to learn to wait, to learn to be patient. It causes an environment in us when we don't get what we want right away to struggle, which leads to growth. There are times when an answer to prayer isn't the timing of God. We're not ready for it. So it's coming in right in his timing. And, and there's a strength that comes only through the struggle. It would come no other way. You're not going to read a book about it. It's not going to come from a Bible study. But rather it's going to come through your own personal experience of following God and struggling through and, and persevering. And I can't wait to hear of all the testimonies that are going to come in this time period, in this time period, in the, you know, whenever you're hearing this on the radio, I'm teaching in the year 2020, right in the middle of uh, the biggest crisis I've ever experienced in, in my entire life, the, the biggest restrictions I've ever faced of, of anything that I've seen as an adult or even as a kid. And, and as we go through this, I can't wait to hear the testimonies of what God has done to reveal himself in ways he would have not done so. And, you know, we're going to hear testimonies, too, of people going, well, you know, I didn't really care, and I went off and started drinking. I went off and ran. I went off and quit. I went off and... And you're going to hear a lot of those testimonies. But even then, God can use that. But we're going to hear the testimonies of, no, I was faced with this, and I persevered. I was faced with this, and as hard as it was... I mean, I, I, I even think, you know, there's going to be somebody who goes, I even had the bottle in my hand. And the Lord gave me strength to put it down. I even went to my, you know, my familiar dealer and I turned the corner. I was ready to sign the divorce papers. It was just too much. We couldn't take it anymore. It was bad before this all started. But I waited and God has done a work in our marriage. Persevere. Steady on. I'm glad that Daniel didn't give up because he got the answer in chapter 11 that we've been, been learning about. He, he was able to move forward with stamina and strength, with faith and commitment that are built up in the realm of our struggles. So in chapter 10, Daniel's about 85, 90 years old, a man of wisdom, a man of experience. In prayer for 21 days, he gets the answer. Chapter 11, we get the message, if you were with us last time. If you weren't, you can catch up with all these studies on our app and our newly we just relaunched a brand new website and the studies are so much easier to find now. And there's a whole tab of the book of Daniel. And the best way to view chapter 11 is how we studied last time. Chapter 11 has, uh, ha- ha- is divided really into two parts. The first part, remember, really I guess you put it this way. The best way to understand Daniel 11 is to think of the 70 weeks of Daniel that we learned in chapter 9. The prophetic time clock. And the first part of chapter 11, where we looked at up to verse 35 and covering a couple different verses, all took place in the first 69 weeks. And the rest of what we're going to study today is going to take place in the final week, what we know as the seven-year great tribulation period. So with all that in mind, let's pick up in chapter 11, verse 36. The king will do, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, the king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed only until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or the god loved by women or for any other god, for he will boast that he is greater than them. Instead of these, he will worship the God of fortresses, a God of his ancestors, a God his ancestors never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expen- expensive 
gifts. So somewhere between verses 36 and 38, there's a large gap of time. And it's the gap of time between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel. According to Romans chapter 11, verse 25, you may commonly know this gap of time, which, by the way, we are living in right now. We are living in the end of the 69th week, awaiting, and hopefully we don't see it, that the rapture of the church comes and we don't see the final 70th week of Daniel. But it's commonly known, according to Romans chapter 11, verse 25, as the fullness of the Gentiles. And and let me read it to you in the New Living. It says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will only last until the full number of the Gentiles comes to Christ. That's the New Living. The New King James is what we're more familiar with, and that is until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. The appointed time back in verse 35 is still yet future. Notice, it says, some of the wise will fall victim to persecution. In this way, they will be refined and cleansed and made pure until the time of the end, for the appointed time is still to come. It is still yet future as we're studying Daniel ourselves. There is coming a time that's still future for us that will be so bad that it's never been experienced in all of human history. According to Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, it says, For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began. It will, it will never be so great again, Jesus taught. In fact, unless the time of calamity is shortened, not one single person will survive, but will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. And who is being described here in this section? None other than that one world leader that rises up in the great tribulation period that we've studied many times and now we're getting greater insights, a man that we know as the Antichrist. We don't know his name yet, but I do believe he's alive. Like he's not, I don't believe he's a baby right now. I think we are so close to the coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, that this guy's being set up. And you go, come on, Ed, you don't believe that. No, I do believe that. And I should have clipped the article. I didn't get a chance to do it. But where we have the former prime minister of England rising up and saying, we are in such bad straits. It is so difficult that we need to appoint a one world. We need one leader to rally all the leaders of the world to help solve this dilemma. And and when you have others, um, high dollar billionaires, and Bill Gates coming together and wanting to fund the UN, an organization that already has military might around the world, wanting to fund the UN to collaborate and come together and and we're just all one world and we'll just all have peace and we'll have one leader and all will go well. You see folks, this is happening in your lifetime. This is the news being posted online now. These are the the little notifications I'm getting on my phone while I'm teaching. Things are popping up and things are happening and no other generation has ever seen. Neither has any generation really seen the kind of globalism that can be brought about in an instant. And you see the globalism being brought about. um, Whatever you're looking at behind the scenes, people mock the thought of an antichrist, people mock the Bible teaching about a one world government, people, and I'm not talking about the conspiracy theories here and all the fanciful ideas, I'm just talking about what the Bible says. The Bible couldn't be clearer. The, the people mock about a one world government where money won't be necessary, where credit cards won't even be necessary, where you can just walk around with a mark on your hand or your forehead. And you can purchase things just by walking in and out of a market. And they just know who you are. (laughs) And they just, oh, we'll just connect it to your bank account and to your tab. That's happening right now. And so as the Bible describes the Antichrist, take it seriously. We we learn a few things about him that I want to point out. Come back to me. Come back with me, would you, in verse 36. Number one, I want you to see his arrogance. The Antichrist and his arrogance. He's going to do according to his own will, or it says in the New Living, the king will do as he 
pleases. He will exalt himself and claim to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. This is an arrogant man who will do as he pleases, exalt himself, and do everything according to his own will, like we learn of the seeds of rebellion in Lucifer in the presence of God. As he claims over and over again, I will, I will, I will. The Antichrist will be empowered by the devil himself and will do as he wills. Arrogance. Here's some from homework. You can go to uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and just read the chapter and compare the Antichrist to the devil and the rebellion of Lucifer. Notice in verse 36 also his prosperity. The Antichrist will be very prosperous. It says in the second half there, he will succeed, but only until the time of the wrath of God, only till the time of wrath is completed. It's a great tribulation period. Is God pouring upon, pouring out his wrath upon Christ rejecting men and women. And you just read it through of, of the trumpets and the 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 seals, the trumpets, the bowls, and just wrath after wrath. And instead of repenting, people would rather say, just let the rocks fall on me. People will be trying to end their life and they they can't during the great tribulation period. Instead of just surrendering. And just instead of just repenting. And he'll be prosperous. But I want you to notice his prosperity has a time limit on it. The devil has a time limit. He's not going to have full reign forever. And you think about some of the battles that you go through, some of the issues in your life right now, and it just feels like it's going on forever. And you don't see a way out. You you don't see it ever ending. You, You don't see it ever changing. And it discourages you because the reality of the situation is ever before you. And you didn't make it up. It is real, whatever it might be. There's real situation, real warfare, real difficulty, and you've gotten into a mode of being up under the weight of that difficulty and now you don't see it ending and you you look at somebody like the antichrist and go why does he get away with it but he's not getting away with anything he's a tool of god in the last days that there is no power that's not under the power of god god is the supreme power and everything that passes into your life and mine is father filtered He's allowed it into your life. Sometimes he sends it into our lives. As we've learned with storms, sometimes God will literally send us into a preordained storm. But nothing comes into your life that hasn't passed through the Father first. It's filtered by a sovereign care and concern. We think we know what's best for us, but God knows what's best for us. And we trust him with our lives. I think back to when you were born again. It was such an exciting time. Many of us came to the altar praying because our lives were really jacked up and upside down and we're going nowhere. And, and not only going nowhere, but sin was ruining and rotting our lives. And, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, you, you might be listening, watching right now, you're like, Ed, that's me. My life is rotting away. It's ruined. My relationships are broken and I'm addicted and I'm running and I'm, and and here you are tuned in and God is presenting to you the good news of the gospel like he presented to us, that God loves you and and he loves you not even in the condition you're in right now. He, He loved you at the worst condition. There you are sitting in a jail cell wondering and just buried under the shame. You know, you made a mistake, but shame has taken hold of you and now you think you're the mistake but you're not the mistake. You're a man, you're a woman that has made mistakes. Again, mistake is an easier word to swallow, but the Bible says that you've not just made a mistake, you've sinned against a holy and a righteous God. That's why it hurts so much. It's not just some little mistake, you know, I dialed a wrong number or I made a wrong turn. Sin is against a holy and a righteous God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And it's not just death at the end of life, but it's the death of dreams, it's the death of relationships, it's the death of hope, it's the death of joy. I I mean, sin wreaks havoc in lives. And here you are and here we were walking into a church to hear about the love of God. Just to think that God, my creator, as bad as it is and as bad as I am, sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me. And there actually is hope for my life. That this isn't the end. 
that, that it's, it's bad, but it doesn't have to stay bad. And it's going to get worse, but it doesn't have to get worse. And I'm telling you today that Jesus Christ, he came. Well, let, let me read it to you. Many times I quote it, but let me just read it to you. So the power of God's word. If you want to take your Bibles, you're following along. Just go over to John 3 with me. We so many times camp on John 3, 16. And I want to share that with you. But I want you to hear what else Jesus said. You might be surprised that Jesus is the one that ta- taught us this truth. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his own, one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's probably how you remember it. And it's so good. It's the gospel. It's the good news that today... In just a few moments, you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. But listen to what else Jesus says. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. Did you hear that? There's no judgment to anyone that believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. That's the problem. It's not all the things you've done. It's not all the bad decisions you've made. It's not the addiction that you present yourself to, although those are all painful difficulty. This is the issue. Anyone that does not believe in him has already been judged. You're living under the judgment of God. You're living apart from your life source. He says the judgment is based on this fact. This is the judgment. God's light came into the world, but people love darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. Who do you love today? The own darkness of your life? I mean, if you think about it, you know, nobody, nobody loves darkness like really willingly, but you know, you feel trapped and now you're gonna have to admit and you're gonna have to come clean and you're gonna have to leave some things and you have to say no to other things and you're gonna have to admit how weak you are. But if you've been with us for this whole time, you know, one of our prayers one of, the time, one of the things we were praying and we encourage you to pray was about the weakness in life matched with God's strength and to admit that you're weak. And so I want to encourage you today and just again in a few moments, I want to encourage you to surrender your life by repenting of your sins, by acknowledging them before God. Because in that moment, your life is just filled with hope. It's just so exciting. It's so, you're just in great anticipation of what it could become. You were right on the edge. Everything was just about destroyed. And then God rescued you, pulled you out. There's actually a place in the Bible that talks about how, how exciting it was to be pulled out of the quicksand, out of the muck and the mire, and just the being stuck. And God wants to unstuck you and move you forward and, and do a great work in you and through you if you'll just surrender. Jesus said, if you want to follow him, you need to first deny yourself. It's one of the most challenging things in our lives, to deny ourselves, to acknowledge that we've given up our rights and our privileges in order to follow God's plan for our life. The Antichrist is prosperous, but just for a time. And even what you're facing right now, it's just for a time. This world is not all there is. There's a physical and a spiritual And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. So on the negative side, the Antichrist is going to be very successful, very rich. He's going to be in that political uh, sphere where the whole world, I mean, he's going to have the riches of the whole world. I'd say that's pretty rich. Uh, And and the whole world is going to be looking to him for help. Thirdly, one, he's, he's arrogant. Number two, he's prosperous. Number three, I want you to notice in verse 37, his rebellion against religion. It says, he have no respect for the gods of his ancestors, or the God loved by women, or for any other God. So everything is off limits for him, not just Christianity, not just Judaism. Now, because of this one verse, some scholars, commentators believe that the Antichrist will be Jewish because of this phrase, neither the gods of his fathers, but we don't know for sure, it's just conjecture. Number four, not only is he rebellious against all religion, because he's going to, why would he do that? I mean, you guys that are familiar already, you know, he's created his own. <laughs> so he's made himself God. 
So of course he's going to rebel against any kind of organized religion, any truth telling. He's going to put to death people preaching the gospel. It's going to be vicious in the great tribulation. Uh, but also notice uh, in verse 37, he has no regard for the desire of women or in the New Living Translation, uh, it talks about, they, rec- they translate this, the God loved by women. Now, some have suggested by this verse uh, that the, the Antichrist will be homosexual, uh, but the phrase desire of women or translated here, the God of, um, the God loved by women um, really just could also refer to and more often refers to in the Hebrew uh, that the, the mom's desire to birth Messiah. So kind of a Jewish connotation here, not necessarily pointing toward homosexuality, but some people believe that. And I wanted to throw that out there just in case you run across some uh, YouTube video and it's out there, uh, you know what the Bible has to say and that this phrase actually could mean something else. Uh, and it most likely means that. Also in verse 38, I want you to notice he has confidence in his military might. As you notice, instead of these, he'll worship the God of fortresses, which is basically saying that he'll trust in military. He is the exact opposite of what God desires. Remember Antichrist? He's the exact opposite of Christ. Remember, anti has two meanings, opposite and in place of, and he's both. And remember, all the way back, David, David being a type of Jesus, all the way back in David, what was David and the kings of Israel told not to do? Don't trust in hor- and, and, uh, don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in horses. Don't trust in your military might. Even for David, don't count them. Because if you count them, you'll trust in them and you'll brag on them. But the Antichrist, he's going to trust in his military might because he will have a multinational force. He will be the head of the, the worldwide military. But then also notice in verse uh, 39, it says, he claims this foreign God's help He will attack the strongest fortresses and he will honor those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority and dividing the land among them as rewards. And so he's got all this gifts. He's using money to buy favor and then he's going to go after uh, anyone that resists him. And and in the spoils, he's going to give all the spoils to those that were loyal to him. And that's a, really a false loyalty because they're just in it to get something from him anyway. Then notice verse 40, we learn of his destruction. His destruction. Then at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north. The king of the north will storm out with chariots, charioteers and a vast navy. He will invade various lands and sweep through them like a flood. He will enter the glorious land of Israel and many nations will fall. But Moab, Edom and the best part of Ammon will escape. He'll conquer many countries and even Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the gold, silver, and treasures of Egypt and the Libyans and Ethiopians will be his servants. But then news from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in great anger to destroy and obliterate many. He will stop, verse 45, between the glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. And while he is there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will will help him. As his control grows, the Arabs will push at him. The Egyptian will begin to wage war with him in the middle of the great tribulation period. And and they'll begin to cry out, we don't want this man to rule over us anymore. And where is he ruling from? Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is the epicenter of prophecy. Just pay attention to Jerusalem. Pay attention to what's happening there. Israel's caught in the middle again. Again, for homework, Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes how the king of the north comes down prophetically and defeats him and comes into Israel. And notice in verse 45, no one comes to help him. He'll be all alone. And it will be overwhelming. Would you turn over to Revelation chapter 19? I want to close here. It takes some time to remind you of the truthfulness of Daniel, but I want to close here in... Revelation 19, verse 11. It's so encouraging. It says, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there, and its rider was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and rages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one could understand except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. 
The armies of heaven dressed in its finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. And he'll rule them with an iron rod and release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. It's at this point in Daniel that Revelation 19 comes and the armies riding with him to bring great defeat and it's over and that's one of the encouraging things about the Bible I know we don't know how our personal situation is going to end I don't know I know we don't know when it's going to be over for us I know that in our own personal lives what we're battling what we're struggling we have the hope of heaven and we know eternally it's going to end but will it end if ever here on earth we don't know but the good news is that the entirety of the story is already written and lay, God has laid it out for us of the victory that he gives to us. And the armies riding with him, which is us, the church, after the rapture, we come back to defeat the Antichrist and to be brought about to bring an end to all of the chaos and confusion that this one world government has brought on. And God is going to use us. And as we were reading through and studying through the book of Daniel, remember God is trustworthy. We've learned about Daniel the man and we also learned about Daniel the prophet. And in his prophecies, God is very precise, very specific. That's why when I'm praying, in my mind, I don't always ask for it, but in my mind, I want a precise word. I want to pray, and I, I want to intercede for you, but I want God to give me a word. Because I know he can. I know he can be very precise. Even as I'm sharing it, I'm not entirely sure if it's from the Lord or not. I mean, it squares with the scriptures and, and I'm sharing it and, and I might even say, you know, I just think the Lord wants me to share this with you and, and I give it to you that it could just be, and it's happened many times, where it's just a precise word in answer to a prayer or a thought or an issue that's been on your heart. So can I encourage you to do the same thing when you're praying? When you're praying for someone, when you're praying about what to text, you know, right now it's a good time to pull out your, your contact list and start reaching out to people you haven't talked to in a while. Maybe even folks that, that you haven't seen in a while. Folks that used to be your neighbors or you lived in another part of town or another state even. Maybe family you haven't connected with and just reach out to them and ask for the Lord to give you a precise word. And then whatever he gives you, just give it away. Because in Daniel's word, you, know, you saw he got dreams and visions. He's got 21 days of praying and then he gets this revelation of this man and like, I, I don't know about you, but that would overwhelm me. I would start to question if it's even an answer from God. But not only was it an answer from God, but it was precise. God unveiling to Daniel and to us things that would come to pass precisely, specifically, not only in the first 69 weeks of Daniel, but also in that final week that's still yet to come. And the prophecies in Daniel were so detailed that the skeptics, even to this day, believe and teach that Daniel didn't write the book. And that if you even do say that Daniel wrote it, that he wrote it long after these events took place. And as we've studied previously, there would be great difficulties in seeing this as anything other than God speaking into the future. And remember we settled it uh, in our studies, you can, in our previous studies in the introduction, that it settles it because Jesus Christ believed in Daniel's writing and even referred to him as what? Daniel the prophet. And Jesus Christ taught us to trust what Daniel wrote. The book itself is claimed to be written by Daniel at least 15 times. You can write them down if you want. It's Daniel 7.2, Daniel 8.1, Daniel 9.2, Daniel 10.7, and Daniel 12.4 are just a few. 7.2.8.1.9.2.10.7.12.4. And sometimes I'm asking you to take notes and you go, well, what's the big deal? Because I'm telling you, you're going to meet someone somewhere shopping in Walmart, at a park, and they're going to try to trip you up with Daniel. They're going to trip you up with something, and, the, and the answer, they're going to be so slick because they're only trained to confuse you with a certain few arguments. But when you know the word, 
and you study it for yourself, you begin to go, what do you mean Daniel didn't write? At least 15 times he said he wrote it. Are you, do you believe, well, you know, somebody else wrote, well, but just what does the Bible say? Let, let's just stick with that. And even more important, as we mentioned in Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And that, according to Matthew, settles it for me. The th- many of the things that Jesus affirmed, Adam and Eve, marriage between one man, one woman, one lifetime, Noah, the ark, the worldwide flood, a literal creation account, all, many of the things that Jesus affirmed is what the critics like to go after. And you know, we may not be the best Bible scholars. We may never know the Hebrew or the Greek inside and out. We may never know, we may never have the kind of mind that can memorize entire books of the Bible. But we can have the mind of Christ. <laughs> he has given us the mind of Christ. And when we trust him and what he taught us, we can go back and begin to validate exactly what is true in God's word and let the skeptics continue to be liars and let every word of God be true in your life. Amen? So as the worship team comes back up uh, today, I want to encourage you, as I mentioned earlier, that if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, The reason we study the book of Daniel is not to fill in all the little juicy points of what's happening in the world, although it's important to know that God has history. He has written history in advance. Or as we learn today, the preciseness of what Daniel received should encourage us to trust our unknown future. There are things in my life right now that are unknown to me, and I have a choice of either trusting my unknown future to the God who I know well. I've, I've had a relationship with God for 29 years. And it's been up and down and there's been at times it's been stronger than other times for sure. But even when I am faithless, the Bible says God is faithful to me. And I know, I know that not only as a Bible verse that's true in and of itself, but I've also experienced it. And it's wise for me as I learn of Daniel that I can trust my future to the God who loves me He has never let me down, ever, never. It's not to mean that my life hasn't been hard or hasn't had its challenges, it has. And here you are listening and watching and here you are intrigued by Bible study and and happen to bounce into where we are here in this church. And the message of God to you today is for you to repent of your sins to acknowledge to God that he's your creator and that he died for your sins. He didn't just die, but the Bible declares that he's alive, that he rose again from the dead. And you know, we also are witnesses of that. We have known the resurrection power of God in our lives. But there were people alive at the time of Jesus rising. Because you go, oh, come on, do you believe that? There were actually witnesses that saw Jesus with their own eyes, touched him with their own hands after he rose again from the dead. Like legitimate human, that by the time, later on, there was a book in the Bible that, they, that a man by the name of Paul said there were over 500 witnesses. Those witnesses were still alive, the ones that Paul was referring to. They were still alive that they could have said at any time, Paul's a liar, that didn't happen. I don't know why he's mentioning us. We weren't there. Not only did that not happen, but his 12 closest friends, the ones that staked their entire life following Jesus, with the exception of one, so I would say 11 or maybe 10, if you take Judas out, you kind of do the math. Most of the followers of Jesus, what we know as his disciples and his apostles, died a martyr's death. Not one of them is recorded as they were being murdered for their faith. Not one of them was recorded. We made it up. It was a lie. He never rose from the dead. They all took the truth of the resurrection and their faith in Jesus Christ to a torturous death. And who does that but those that believe in the truth of what they saw? 
And I invite you into a relationship of following Jesus today. It's not a relationship to join a church. It's not a relationship to follow me. Except to say as I would invite you to follow me as I follow Christ. And when I don't point you to Christ, don't follow me. I'm not worthy to be followed. But I do know this, when my life follows Christ, I want you to follow me so that we follow Christ. Together, fighting the good fight. So wherever you are, the Bible says that in order to, in order to experience this, there is a confession of the mouth and a true belief in the heart. And one of the ways we help you express that is I want to lead you in a prayer. So you can talk to God yourself. And you can acknowledge God in these ways so that you have a memorable point in time that you remember when you were born again. And so would you pray with me, would you? You could say something like this. God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and I believe Jesus rose again from the dead to forgive me of my sins. And I want to follow you, God, all the days of my life. And I admit I don't know a lot about the Bible. And I admit, God, I don't know a lot about you. But I want my life. I want my life to change. And I want hope and joy in my life. And I want to honor you and not live in rebellion against you any longer. So I offer you my life and I receive the gift of salvation and I pray this in Jesus name Amen We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora For prayer or a copy of this study call us at 877-30-GRACE That's 877-304-7223 or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.